Hi, today we're doing something which I think is pretty cool. Some electrolysis. I'd never actually done any before this video, so it's pretty simple, but let's get right into it. So what you'll need for this procedure is some water, a pretty arbitrary amount honestly, some normal table salt, a couple of carbon electrodes, which in my case I just used some old pencil lead, a battery of some kind, since I'm doing it on such a small scale I just use a 9 volt battery, and two wires with alligator clips, of which at least one end of each one has to have rubber on it, and also a container. Let's begin with the electrolysis of just water, and then I'll move on to the electrolysis of the salt water solution. So start by just filling up the beaker or a cup or whatever you're using with water, then get one of the carbon electrodes and one of the wires, and attach the wire onto one end so that most of it's down in the water, but it's not touching the bottom of the vessel. And then repeat the exact same thing for the other electrode and the other wire. So now that both wires are in the water, it's time to hook up the battery. For the 9 volt battery, it's pretty simple. You just hook one wire to the positive end and one wire to the negative end. And the second the battery is hooked up, the electrolysis begins. You can see that immediately both electrodes start bubbling. Although it's pretty minimal and not actually very noticeable until you look close up. It can be observed here that the negative end, the cathode, is bubbling a whole lot more than the positive anode is. But they are still both bubbling. I refer to this process as electrolysis, but what does that really mean? Well, when electricity runs through water, the water itself actually breaks down into simpler products. There are two separate reactions going on, on the anode and the cathode, and I'll explain those here. I'll start with the anode reaction, which is up on screen right now. Two molecules of water yield to form one molecule of oxygen gas, along with four positive 100 ions, which are essentially just protons, and four electrons. So basically the water split apart into oxygen and hydrogen, and then the hydrogen in turn split up into the protons and electrons. That's maybe not a great way of explaining it, but it sort of gives an idea of what happened. Now over to the cathode side of the reaction, where the aforementioned protons and electrons from the hydrogen combine back together to form two molecules of hydrogen gas. So the products of these reactions together are that the anode produces oxygen gas as bubbles and the cathode produces hydrogen gas as bubbles. So quite a while later the reaction was still ongoing and I was actually pretty impressed at how long the battery lasted. And after I took the electrodes out of the water you can see on the cathode there is a small deposit of minerals. That is there since pure water on its own like distilled water is not very conductive at all but this was just tap water, so it does have small trace amounts of minerals in it, so it was somewhat conductive. And theoretically, if I hook this up to a battery that could last forever, the water level would slowly drop down as it converted into hydrogen and oxygen gas until it went below where the electrodes stopped. But the water itself as it remained would be unchanged. But that is not the case for the electrolysis of salt water, so let's get right into that. So in regards to the actual procedure, it is exactly the same as plain old electrolysis of water, except you add salt, it's pretty intuitive. Now in this salt water electrolysis, there's more going on than in just the water electrolysis, and it's called the chloroalkali process, which is kind of the main point of the video. But I'll get into a lot of that in a bit. So I use the same setup of course for this, so I just take that again and lower it back down into the water. And as you can see, like the first time, it instantly starts bubbling. And the reaction is actually a lot quicker and more vigorous than it was the first time. As you can see, most of the water is cloudy. And some of that may come from suspended salt in the water, but the majority of it does seem to be tiny little bubbles. And the difference is much more noticeable this time, with the cathode on the left producing way more gas than the anode does. So let's get into how this is different than the electrolysis of just plain water. Many electrolyses, which is the plural of electrolysis, function very differently depending on what kind of electrolyte was used. The electrolyte being whatever solution has the electricity running through it, which in the first case was water, but now it is salt water. And when referring to the chloroalkali process, people generally mean the industrial use of it, but it does apply to this little thing as well. 
There will be several different reactions in different cases, but for our case, this is an unpartitioned cell, meaning a cell of electrolyte with no membrane between the two electrodes. So basically it's just the two electrodes in the electrolyte and that's it. Where in some cases for industrial uses, there would be some sort of semi-permeable membrane that could regulate where different compounds go and how the reaction occurs. But that's not what we did, so let's move on to the actual reaction. The initial reaction as shown on screen is simply the salt combining with the water to form sodium hydroxide along with hydrogen and chlorine gas. But since there's no membrane, that's not the only thing that occurs. And to be warned, chlorine gas is toxic, so only do this if you are in a very well ventilated area, or have access to a fume hood, especially if you're doing it on a very large scale. I'm doing it, again, like I said before, on a pretty small scale, and not a whole lot of chlorine was produced, so it was okay for me to just have a very well ventilated room without an actual fume hood. But anyway, without a membrane, the hydroxide ions from the production of sodium hydroxide will slowly build up within the electrolyte, causing it to become more alkaline as the reaction continues. This causes the chlorine to disproportionate to form hypochlorite and chloride ions on the anode. So then, less chlorine gas is produced. And the reaction for that is right up on screen. And as this continues, more and more hypochlorite is produced. And the chlorine reacts with the sodium hydroxide in the solution more. Then, less and less chlorine gas is actually produced from that. Of course, this varies based on things that I didn't really know to monitor at the time, such as temperature of the solution, the amount of time that the chlorine is in contact with the solution, and the concentration of the sodium hydroxide, which that last thing I couldn't even really control that much. But anyway, sodium chlorate and sodium chloride are produced as the sodium hypochlorite concentration increases within the solution. And the equation for that is right up on screen. And there are several other variables that can change how the reaction occurs, but I won't go into that now. So anyway, once the reaction had been progressing for quite some time, I was actually pretty surprised at how yellow it looked. That is most likely from the chlorine in the solution, and it really doesn't show up well on camera. Sure, you can see it a little bit, but it was significantly more yellow in person. And it was at a very low concentration, and even though if I did smell the container, it did smell very much like a pool, it wasn't really any stronger than that. And to be honest, I was pretty proud of myself for having produced chlorine and sodium hydroxide at home. Especially seeing as I've never really done anything like this before. And so here was the finished solution, a bit of a mix of a bunch of things. And even though the sodium hydroxide in the solution was in a super super low concentration, I still thought I should try neutralizing it with acid just for demonstration purposes. So as you probably know if you're watching this, an acid and a base mixing together will simply neutralize it, producing a water and a salt, so that way it's safe to pour down the drain. So I poured a little bit of vinegar in, and you can see a tiny bit of bubbling, but it's probably nothing, and probably not even necessary but I thought I might as well do it. So that's the reaction at least done. But another thing which I think is pretty interesting and didn't even know much about until recently was how the chloroalkali process was used in energy production for a long time. In Western Europe, Japan, and the United States, the chloroalkali process was a big industry for a while and is still used fairly commonly today. The first use of the chloroalkali process for chlorine was attributed to William Cruikshank, a chemist, around the turn of the 17th century. However, it wasn't used on an industrial scale until way later in the 1890s. An example being this image of a chloroalkali plant from around 1920. And during the 20th century, it turned into the primary means for the production of chlorine. In addition to the chlorine gas and sodium hydroxide produced, there is also a whole bunch of hydrogen produced. The same number of moles of hydrogen as there was chlorine. And this hydrogen is generally used in the production of things such as hydrochloric acid, ammonia, hydrogen peroxide, etc. So now that I've gone over all that, I think it's time to talk about YouTube a little bit. Recently on my channel, there's been a pretty interesting development. I have recently surpassed 10, and at the time of recording at least, I am now at 12 subscribers. And the majority of these have been in the last month or so, which is a little odd given that I haven't been uploading in a while. But I'm pretty sure it's mostly because that iodine video I made ages ago got a lot of views for some reason, and pretty suddenly as well. And I just want to say that I do know that I am still an absolute microbe in the ecosystem that is YouTube. But it feels really cool that there are people who enjoy my content enough that they want to see more of it. So thank you so much. I know subscriber count doesn't really mean much, but 
it gives me a pretty nice feeling. And yeah, I haven't uploaded in a little while, and that's been mostly because of school, but I'll try my best in the next couple of weeks to upload once a week when I can. And I'll also be trying to make a little bit more long-form content instead of the bunch of shorts that I was for a while. And finally, if you have subscribed, thank you so much, it really means a lot. If you haven't, that's fine too, but I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye.